dialysis extends, there are different kinds of vascular access devices used in critical patient care. It is therefore necessary to have a conversation around the safety of such vascular interventions and how it can be ensured. We welcome you to this webinar organized by the Times of India in association with the Critical Care Division of Biological E Limited, one of the leading producers of anticoagulants in India. Let me introduce our panel for this evening. We are joined by Dr. Sri Chandran L, the consultant interventional cardiologist from the DIPAS. He's a senior con uh, consultant interventional cardiologist at the Department of Cardiology at MGM Healthcare Private, Private Limited. We are also being joined by Dr. Madan Mohan B. He's a senior consultant interventional cardiologist at the MGM Healthcare and he's also the clinical lead at the Department of Cardiology. We're also joined by Dr. M. Sami Kanna. He's a senior consultant and clinical lead at the Department of Internal Medicine at MGM Healthcare Private Limited. We also have with us Dr. Shivraj P. He's a senior consultant in the Department of Internal Medicine at MGM Healthcare Private Limited in Chennai. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, sir. Before we begin the webinar, let me remind you that you are, uh, that uh, remind the viewers who are just tuning in right now that our experts will be taking questions from the viewers. So if you have any queries, please keep them coming and keep posting them in the comment session below. We'll try to answer them for you. So diving right into the webinar, I have my first question for Dr. Sri Chandran right now. As an interventional cardiologist, what are some of the common types of vascular access procedures that you perform on patients, sir? Yeah, good evening. Uh, as an interventional cardiologist, we would be performing both diagnostic and therapeutic procedures in the cath lab. Few of the diagnostic procedures would include a coronary angiogram, which is a diagnostic test to study if, we, if the patient has any blocks in his blood vessels of the heart. That is called a coronary angiogram. Simultaneously, we'd also be doing an angiogram involving the peripheral arterial system. That is, we call a peripheral angiogram. Then there is also, we also would be doing therapeutic procedures like an angioplasty, simple and complex, and also multiple uh, complex procedures involving structural heart disease and also peripheral angioplasties and also subsequently also temporary pacemaker implantations and permanent pacemaker implantation. So the scope is big actually. So as an interventional cardiologist, we are involved in both diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. Thank you for clarifying that, Dr. Sri Chandran. Uh, let me go over to you, Dr. Madan Mohan. Uh, my question for you is, uh, as vascular uh, as access devices or VADs as they are called, are being used almost daily in all inpatient settings, what are the major challenges for healthcare professionals with regard to patient safety? Yeah. Good evening, everybody. So, like, uh, whenever we start doing this uh, puncture, like uh, when we enter the artery, we make a puncture to the blood vessel. So that site is very important for anybody. Uh, the site should be free from any uh, rupture or the blood clot formation in and around the blood vessel site when we are puncturing the blood vessel. So we should take care when we puncture the blood vessel. The, the, we take puncture at different sites of the body, like one in the leg area and another in the hand area and uh, near the chest for pacemaker. So whenever we do puncture for all the three sites, we have to be very careful because that is very important for uh, uh, anybody. Like a blood loss means then a patient will collapse on table. And if the blood gets collected on the site that we call it as hematoma, that becomes a, a later on very uh, critical issue. So we have to be very careful when we puncture the blood vessels of the body. So in that we take one angle is uh, X-ray, that is fluoroscopy, we call it as fluoroscopy in the cath lab. So we mark the site uh, and correctly we take the puncture on the blood vessel. We have the landmark uh, already calculated with the fluoroscopy. So it will be easy for us to enter the site of the blood vessel. Why we take the fluoro is sometimes we may puncture above the artery 
So in that case, when we in the leg, when we puncture above the artery, like it may bleed inside the abdomen, then cause the whole abdomen with the blood inside the abdomen. So that is the main reason we should be very careful when we are puncturing. And we create a puncture below the area of sight, then the whole leg will be getting collected with blood. And there is a, a, a one system called like aneurysm, where the artery gets bulged. That's called the aneurysm. Sometimes the artery and vein gets interconnected. I, they, we call it as arteriovenous fistula. So these are all nuisance in the future when we don't puncture properly at the exact site. So we have to be meticulous and correctly position ourselves to puncture with the fluoroscopy guided. And other times we take the ultrasound. So the ultrasound give us the correct guidance to puncture. So whether we are on the above the artery, so ultrasound neatly, uh, precisely say that you are above the artery. So ultrasound will be very useful. Nowadays, we started uh, using ultrasound guided puncture. So even when near the chest area, when we are puncturing, there is a lung behind it. So when you puncture the lung, then the whole uh, lung will uh, explore with the uh, air outside. So we call it as pneumothorax. So we have to be very careful on puncturing the vessel near the lung area. And when we put some catheters inside the jugular vein, for uh, central venous pressure to monitor the heart pressure. There also we have to be very careful when we puncture this area because it has more blood vessels and uh, other uh, structures nearby. So uh, we have to take with ultrasound guided for particularly in, the, in this area to puncture the site. So these are all the, and uh, one more gadget we have is micropuncture. So which is very small size, which, uh, which uh, when we put inside like a small needle inside the artery. So even when we puncture at the neighboring structure, it may not cause any major issue when we are puncturing. So micropuncture catheter needle is a precise gadget to prevent bleeding or hematoma in and near the uh, structure around the blood vessel. So these are all the gadgets we normally take to prevent blood and uh, site puncture site uh, blood clot yeah, around it. Right. Thank you so much for explaining that in so much detail, uh, Dr. Madan Mohan. Let me go over to you, Dr. Swami Kanna. What are the general patient safety measures being followed as part of the protocol? One of the commonest uh, procedures that is per performed on the patients who are admitted in the hospital or as patients is the peripheral venous cannulation. So the, from the patient point of view, uh, there are several things which is important. You, you have to make sure before you do, a, do, do the procedure. The first thing is uh, you have to identify the patient, whether you are doing it on the right patient. So you check the name of the patient, age of the patient, hospital number. Then you also, because sometimes patient may be conscious, sometimes patient may not be conscious. So you may not be able to tell you the name and the age. And, so you have to check the band. Usually there is a band tied to the patient when they are admitted. So you can check, cross-check with the thing. Then you select your site of uh, cannulation. For that, no, you need a very good knowledge of uh, anatomical knowledge of the veins and the arteries. Uh, then um, you have to take the consent from the patient, whether, uh, whether you are doing it for a diagnostic purpose or therapeutic purpose. What is the purpose of doing a cannulation? The patient should understand it's a blind procedure. You may not be able to get it at first puncture because it is a blind procedure. Sometimes you may have to try one or two times, maybe sometimes three times. That they have to clearly understand it is a uh, blind procedure so that is fine. not every time you may not hit the vein. Then once you decided to, you get the consent from the patient, you select the site in such a way that it will not interfere with day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and you tell them why you are selecting that particular site for uh, putting a venous cannula into that period. From the patient point of view, uh, you have to uh, minimize the pain when, when you are doing a peripheral vein cannulation because it is whatever said and done, it is a painful procedure. 
so once you do the cannulation you have to make sure that you are following all the safety precaution cleanliness then uh, selecting the doing the procedure at the aseptic measures with the aseptic so that they don't get uh, infections in in the coming days then once you uh, the put the cannula you have to decide whether you are doing it for uh, diagnostic or therapeutic purpose that you have to inform the patient in advance suppose you are doing just drawing the blood for some testing it's called diagnostic suppose you are going to administer some drugs or the fluids that is called therapeutic uh, intervention so the other thing that you have to inform the patient is the the peripheral venous can venous cannulation cannot be kept it for long time the number of days that uh, should be limited is to 3 to 4 days the according to the inter- current inter- international standards you cannot keep it for more than 4 days the why you should not keep it uh, more than 4 days is it, because it is a needle uh, needle needle uh, topped with a plastic cannula this pl- plastic material can cause uh, irritation to the blood vessels and the inflammation it can also sometimes cause uh, the infections what is called blood skin related infections so it can also cause inflammation of the blood vessels what is called as phlebitis thrombophlebitis sometimes uh, when you cannulate it can start bleeding if they have a patient has a, a bleeding tendency so it is important before putting the cannula to take all the precautions and once you put the cannula inside then make sure you um, properly secure the cannula because in, during sleeping time they may may come up if you don't fix it uh, properly so fixing the cannula is also it's a responsibility of the person who does it um after every day it has to be monitored and uh, flushed uh, for uh, you have to look for infections around in and around the vein where you have cannulated so all these safety measures uh, you have to take whenever you decide to do a peripheral venous cannulation right thank you for that dr swami kata coming to you dr shivraj just taking off from the other doctor's point uh, what are the com- common risks involved in vascular access what could be the possible fallouts if it's not done properly see um, let me just clear out one thing so when we say vascular access it means what vessel are we accessing okay whether we are accessing the artery or the vein that's number one number 2 whether it's whether the artery or the vein whether it's a peripheral or a central when i say peripheral it's a smaller structure when i say a central it's a bigger structure the common structures like when as uh, dr sami kumar sir was telling is a peripheral venous uh, like cannulation which we, which is commonly done in the ward for administration of drugs and so on. and uh, or for drawing blood as well secondly like for the arteries usually the posterior tibial or the radial arteries are involved for the cardiac procedure when we say about uh, the central venous cannulation so central venous catheterization okay it depends on which uh, site are you doing it okay whether it's like a short term mid term or a long term okay so the common sites which are used uh, for the central cannulations for central venous catheterizations are the jugular in the neck and in the chest we have the subclavian and in the thigh we have the femoral actually so which site to use it depends actually each site has got its own advantages and disadvantages so coming to your question about the fallouts okay so when you use a peripheral uh, uh, venous access um, make sure as as the doctor uh, swankan was telling make sure the area is clean then because of the more chance of phlebitis that's an inflammation of the vessel which is called a thrombophlebitis which we usually see when doing a central venous access the common risk is bleeding that is the most common risk because you do the central access for very sick patients and most of the time they have a condition called coagulopathy we say so what do i mean by coagulopathy is an altered ptinr okay and an aptt this is a test we usually do so when these values are really altered there's an increased chance of bleeding okay and there's a simple test called platelets which we check before this can before the cannulations are done if the platelet count is less than 20000 and if the ptinr is more than 3 there's increased chance of bleeding okay so what do you do then 
So the patient needs to be cannulated as well. So what do you do then? So you transfer some, transfuse some blood products. The common blood products, if the platelets are low, less than 20,000, you transfuse platelets. If the PTINR is more than three, okay, so you uh, give them fresh frozen plasmas, that is FFP. This is done to prevent the bleeding. Suppose the platelet count is between 20,000 to 50,000, the INR is between one to three, there's still a chance of bleeding, but the chances are quite less. And if a proper person, if a skilled person is doing it, and the chance of bleeding is quite less. So what do you mean by a skilled person? Okay. See, like who is called a skilled person? Okay. So anyone who can like uh, an anesthetist or a critical care person or a, a physician, whoever it is. So any person has completed more than 50 cannulations. I mean, more than 50. They are termed to be called skilled. In US and all per year, they have a category to do so many procedures uh, to call themselves as a skilled operator. So as I mentioned, bleeding is one of the important risks that's, that to be taken care. But in case of very sick patients, um, there's no other go because the, you have to weigh the, between the risk and the benefit uh, and do the cannulations. The second thing as Dr. Madan was saying, see what are the structures which is present in the neck and also in the chest, okay? So when we are doing a jugular approach, okay? The common vessel which is near to the jugular vein is the carotids. So there's an increased chance of puncturing the carotids. So when you puncture the carotids, there can be a hematoma which is formed in the neck, which can compress the trachea and cause airway obstruction as well. That is one of the common complications. And the second complication is when we are cannulating, you can even like uh, puncture the, the pleura of the lung, which can lead to a pneumothorax, okay? So this is one of the ma uh, major side effects which happens. The fourth side effect, which we usually encounter is when we're doing uh, the central venous axis, we insert something called a guide wire. Okay, so when this guide wire is inserted really deep, it goes and irritates the ventricles of the heart. It leads to dangerous arrhythmias. If they are not monitored properly, the patient can have an instant cardiac arrest. Person. So whenever you're kind of can letting, make sure the guide wire or the catheter doesn't pass more than 20 centimeters. That's a landmark you have and you do it. And um, other follow-up is when you're using the subtravian, which is in the chest, okay? So if you puncture the carotids, at least you can even compress the vessel and can stop the bleeding. But when you do a subclavian approach and you hit a vessel or something like that, it can cause a disastrous bleeding, okay? And the femorals, femorals are quite safe only, but the problem is it's in, in the pelvic area and the inguinal region, there are increased chance of infections in the femoral regions. So these are the usual disadvantages which we encounter. And certain precautions needs to be taken to prevent this infection. As I have told, you should do a lot of aseptic precautions. So make sure that like, it should be done like a proper surgical procedure whenever you're candidating. So make sure the patient is completely draped and uh, make sure the area is properly cleaned. And the solution that should be used is a chlorhexidine solution and not povidonoidin. Povidonoidin can also be used, but the preferred agent is a chlorhexidine alcohol swab, which is kind of done to clean that area. And um, third thing is a person who's kind of doing it, he should be like wearing a proper surgical mask, cap, and also he should be, uh, he should be also properly draped so that and uh, he doesn't cause any infection to the patient. So these are the usual follow-ups. Right. Uh, Dr. Sri Chandran, coming to you next. As a senior consultant interventional cardiologist, I wanted to ask you, uh, is for better patient safety, is it practically possible to form a specialized vascular access service team for the assessment, insertion, uh, management and complications reduction? Is such a team available in any of the specialized care centers today? Yeah, definitely. Yes, it is definitely possible to form a specialized team. Basically, the concept of a vascular access specialist team has basically come forward basically to achieve better outcomes for patients. There are several advantages for having such a team in a, in a big hospital setup. The Having a team comprises basically of a critical care a physician, internal medicine department, a cardiologist, and also a vascular specialist. So the advantage of having such a big team, the chances of you getting a proper puncture is always great. And that too, the likelihood of a puncture on the first attempt is quite high. And there will be few comp less complications when you achieve it in the first attempt. Not only that, with the fewer complications and the more precise puncturing of the artery leads to better troubleshooting. And also, the such a committee, they're always exposed to the latest guidelines. As Dr. Sivraj was telling, 
they will be abridged to the latest guidelines of puncture now we have moved forward in the recent past we used to do a puncture based on the anatomical landmark and various other structures now it is precisely through fluoroscopy and that too via ultrasound guidance so with a core group of you know couple of uh, specialized people the risks of complications are quite low these days so basically now i think in the near future patients will be asking themselves for a qualified healthcare worker for each and every uh, vascular device insertion and post op care there are now several trials and studies done throughout the world especially in the us which recommend that when critically ill patients in the icu uh, the micropuncture needle and micropuncture and all critical uh, patients have to uh, you know they need to get uh, access to a vascular device through a critical care team so i think that's the way forward definitely the uh, team will uh, do a, a better job in getting access to a artery right thank you for that uh, dr madan mohan uh, what kind of education is generally given to paramedical staff and the other, other assisting staff uh, about vascular access sir? yes the dr swami kanno earlier was telling the site should be very clean that is we call it a sterile preparation because uh, uh, there are enough like uh, when we enter inside the blood vessel we may carry the infection inside the blood stream which is more dangerous in the later part after finishing the procedure if the patient suffers from infection that will be a great disaster so we have to be very careful when we enter the site of puncture so normally we have to keep everything sterile the sterile preparation is important for the staffs uh, who are go- going to be along with us while doing the procedure so that is a first first and foremost uh, safety concern next is when you are puncturing like uh, the patient should be not, not uh, moving this side or that, that side so it should not hit the next blood vessel so immobilizing the patient is important so the staff should be very alert and they should fix the patient properly on the cath lab table so so that they don't move during the course of the procedure so we normally when we are doing it in the hand we fix the hand and do it and when we are doing it in the leg uh, in the taking the blood vessel in the leg so we fix the leg and do it otherwise they will be getting moved from this side and that side which may go hit the, the other structures near the area so this uh, this is a second safety aspect then uh, they have to be carefully flushing the sheath often because when when we enter the blood vessel we keep the sheath inside the uh, blood vessel so the uh, normal tendency the blood is to get clot every every 5 minutes we keep the blood going smoothly so otherwise if the uh, blood gets clotted in the sheath then it will be a problem while again when we enter the uh, sheath again so we normally flush the sheath every 5 minutes to keep the line patent so uh, so that will be easy for us to enter uh, redo the procedure everything so this also the staff should be alert in doing that uh, every time flushing the sheath uh, sheath is the one which uh, is kept inside the blood vessel of the uh, artery then after finishing everything the compression uh, when we are coming out so to close the puncture site how do we do uh, the compression is the foremost important because if you don't compress properly then later on the blood will be oozing from the site of the puncture and uh, later part after 12 hours after the procedure the hemoglobin the blood uh, level will come down so that time then we we have to go redo and uh, make the uh, puncture site re uh, suture it so those are the things we have to be very careful when we compress the area so that also the staff should be uh, accurately doing the compression bandage so and then uh, uh, when to remove the timing everything we have to tell the staff uh, uh, correctly so like uh, for example when we puncture the femoral artery that is in the leg so we have to uh, give a timing like a 6 hours 8 hours the patient should not uh, mobilize from the bed if they mobilize from the bed then uh, the artery will get oozing the blood oozing will start so they have to be immobilized in the bed for 6 to 8 hours those points should be told to the patient and the staff should be uh, uh, told the attender also the timing 
how long they should lie on the cot after the procedure. So these are all the education. We have to tell the staffs to appropriately tell the patient and the take care of the patient uh, precisely. Thank you for explaining. <laughs> uh, Dr. Swami, can I come to you next? Uh, Dr. Shivraj did mention a little bit about peripheral axis and central axis, but what are the different types of vascular accesses in general uh, that may be required for patients? The commonest one, and as I was telling you earlier, the commonest one is a peripheral venous cannulation. The other cannulation that may be required is the central venous uh, cannulation. The, now, uh, off late, we have what is called peripherally inserted uh, central cannulation. You can reach the bigger artist by inserting a smaller catheter peripherally. That is done usually when uh, when we need to continue treatment for a longer period, like, like chemotherapy. When you want to give it for a longer duration, four weeks, six weeks, when you want to give a antifungal for mucormycosis, you need a peripherally inserted uh, central venous catheter. So that is another type of uh, catheter, catheterization which is used. The other one is... Uh, the arterial cannulations when patients who are very sick, critically ill, admitted to the intensive care units, when you want the when you want to monitor the hemodynamics, uh, the blood pressure, the mean arterial pressure, if you want to monitor all those uh, informations, uh, you need a arterial cannulation. Uh, that can be done through the the hand, what is called radial artery cannulation, can be used for monitoring purposes. Um, these are the three common uh, cannulations which is usually done. There are other accesses uh, available or the AV fistulas for uh, the renal dialysis patients. And also there is off leg, you must have been hearing about a lot, lot about ECMO. ECMO is uh, used for the uh, recently, all all these patients who are in respiratory failure, one of the treatment that offer offered is uh, the ECMO therapy, extracorporeal membranous oxygen, which is otherwise called the oxygen. It's, the blood is oxygenated outside the body. So for that, you know, you need venous and arterial cannulation simultaneously. And uh, there are other procedures. Uh, I'm sure uh, Madan and uh, Sri Chandran will be talking about is the the off late they are replacing the valves of the heart through a peripheral artery cannulation. So that's called TAVI and the mitral valve repair and mitral valvuloplasty. All that is done through the venous and arterial cannulation simultaneously from the periphery. So these are the different types of cannulation that is being done for a therapeutic and diagnostic purposes. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Shivraj, coming to you next. Venous access is one of the most basic and critical for patient care. What are the major types of VADs used in general? And could you enlighten us when to use and avoid each of them? See, I was, as I was telling you before, what is the purpose of uh, doing it? Okay. Whether it's for a, a midterm or a short term or a long term. Okay. So when, uh, when you use it for a short term, Okay, when you use it for a short term, the major uh, indications like it's used mostly in the critical care unit, okay, where we can lay the, the jugular or the subclavian or the femoral. Okay, basically, it is done uh, to give the fluids, IV fluids. The, basically, if the patient is in shock, uh, whether it's cardiogenic or a septic shock, we give certain uh, medicines to improve the BP, which we call it as vasopressors. Okay. And um, sometimes when uh, uh, the patient is really sick, they need some nutrition as well, where we give something called a TPM, which is called a total parental nutrition as well. Okay. So the type of vascular, so coming to your question of the type of vascular access devices, um, see, we uh, have a single lumen catheters. We have a double lumen or a multi-lumen catheters. Okay. And uh, see, depending, the, these lumens will have the diameter of the catheters can be bigger in size. So when the diameter is bigger, the chance of infections are also are more. The other type of catheters we use commonly, which is used in the ICU, are called non-tunnel catheters, okay, where uh, the catheter is inserted and a part of the catheter is kind of outside, 
okay so they are used only for a short term purpose for a long term purpose we use something called a tunnel catheters okay this is basically used for patients on a long term administration of drugs such as any chemo medications as dr sami kan sir has mentioned so what is the difference between a tunnel and a non tunnel catheter see when this catheter port when it comes out it's kind of uh, stitched under the skin through the subcutaneous plane and just only a port alone comes out so there will be a cuff which is outside so the difference between a tunnel and a, a non tunnel catheters are the chances of infection in a, a tunnel catheter is quite less because there is a cuff which is there which prevents the uh, entry of the bacteria and other organisms and we have some other uh, like like perm catheters that's it's like um which is used for dialysis as well so these are the common uh, vascular access devices which are used uh, thank you so much for that uh, uh, dr shrichandran coming back to you next what is the risk of thrombosis in various vads or vascular access devices and how can you manage this risk yeah see first of all let's look at the incidence of thrombosis the incidence of uh, vascular uh, assist device thrombosis is around 3 to 50% now how does thrombus actually happen so it's very simple it's accumulation of actually fibrin or thrombin inside and around the catheters so what does it result in usually it results in the loss of the catheter use itself the basic purpose of the catheter insertion is lost then subsequently it leads to venous thrombosis infection and uh, most probably the only way we can help this is removal of the catheter per se in total so that would be the main management of thrombosis the other uh, management uh, protocols are very simple anticoagulation with the help of low molecular weight heparin which is usually given anywhere between 3 months or till the catheter is in situ and finally as i told you earlier catheter removal is the only choice there is another option called svc filter where a filter is placed above the uh, svc vein where the thrombus is prevented from migrating proximally finally the last option is thrombolysis especially in when you are about to save a critically you know critical limb, limb ischemia so these are the four main options we have now basically what does all this thrombosis lead to it results in increase in the hospital stay it increases the morbidity of the patient it leads to further cost the expenses shoots up so basically the thrombosis is a major factor which has to be taken care in the earlier early part itself now this incidence of 3 to 50% is quite high so unless you early you know the early identification is the only way to help in you know reducing this uh, risk of thrombosis and as i told you management with anticoagulation is the main way secondly if thrombosis is extensive then the entire catheter has to be removed so this is how you are going to manage a case of catheter thrombosis okay uh, thank you for that dr shri chandran uh, dr madan mohan Uh, what are the critical cardiovascular complications involved in vascular access for hemodialysis yeah see basically they keep the catheter uh, here in the vein for longer period so whenever they want a dialysis uh, they frequently do uh, like a weekly thrice or weekly twice so so they keep the uh, catheter inside the jugular here so what happens when they put the catheter here sometimes it goes and hits the, as like a doctor suraj was telling it may go hit the cardiac uh, part which is the uh, like which we call it as tamponade so we in our, we have uh, faced a lot of people getting this uh, uh, tamponade so we have to be tamponade means that it goes and ruptures the heart so we have to be very careful when we insert the uh, catheter inside because it straight away goes to the heart so and uh, goes and ruptures the heart so this is a major complication we encounter during putting the catheter here during dialysis time the second one will be perforating any vessel if you put like in the femoral artery in the thigh area when they are putting the catheter it may perforate and uh, it, it can cause the bleeding inside the abdomen or the thigh area so this is a, this is called as perforation the third is uh, like when when you are doing here the lung is at the back so that can puncture the lung and cause air leakage it is called pneumothorax so the, uh, these are the uh, types of uh, complication one is uh, tamponade another is perforation another is pneumothorax then la- then commonly seen will be the uh, infection how what uh, dr swamikanno was telling 
So that we have to very, be very careful while putting any catheter. Sterile preparation is must. Then when you keep the catheter for a longer period, see, normally then the vein, the in the vein area, the blood can get clotted. That is called thrombosis. So to prevent that, normally we give anticoagulation for a longer period of time. So the, 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 these are all the five complications we encounter during the catheterization for the dialysis. Right. So I'm going to come to you next. Uh, will different uh, will experts from various disciplines uh, be part of the vascular access service team? And in this case, what would their responsibilities be? Oh, was it directed to me? Because I, I asked Dr. you. Swamikana, it is for you. Okay. Can you repeat the question? Uh, yes. Because I'm, I lost your voice. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to understand, will experts from different disciplines be part of the vascular access service team? And in that case, what their responsibilities will be? The, I think, you know, the, that was uh, um, already Sri Chandran has explained. There will be future will be, there will be a specialist doing all these uh, interventions, vascular access interventions. That will include internal medicine, then the critical care, then the cardiologist, and maybe the radiologist. So the responsibility is, uh, our responsibility is to give the best out of the any procedure done, the best outcomes. Then preventing the complications which are bound to happen or reduce the complications which are bound to happen. Like they said, you know, the thrombosis, infection, bleeding, and the complications like pneumothorax, uh, the cardiac tamponade, all that uh, being explained by Dr. Madhani. So our responsibility is uh, make sure we have a skilled persons like uh, Sivraj said, you, know, you need to have a skilled people in the team to do the procedure and make sure you get the best outcome, make sure you don't uh, get uh, infections. And also you teach uh, time to time your, uh, the staff, they make, make them understand that what is the uh, uh, purpose of the procedure, what is the importance of the procedure, what can go wrong, what, how to avoid the complications. So by way of doing a continuous medical education for the staff, for the nurses, for your own junior colleagues and developing the next generation of people to tackle all this will be your responsibility. Right, uh, Dr. Shivraj coming to you next. Um, I'm, I'm sure like the other doctors have discussed this in some detail, but I just wanted to uh, reiterate this question. Uh, what are some of the most serious infections associated with BADs and how do you manage them? When it comes to infection, we classify into two categories. It's a local and systemic. Uh -huh. Local is at the site where the, the catheter is inserted. So common thing we, uh -huh. we usually see is an erythema. Erythema is nothing but a redness or a mild exudate which can come. And the uh, for this, basically, antibiotics are not required. I mean, systemic antibiotics are not required. Proper care and a topical antibiotic like imiprosin can be applied. Okay, uh, But in case the patient develops any systemic uh, signs of infection, we need to start the patient antibiotics. So this is the local thing. What is systemic? Systemic means when the bacteria enters the bloodstream and causes bacteremia. Okay, So this will include fever. Patient will go in for an early sepsis. They will have altered the uh, mental status. Um, the, the lactase can be elevated. They can even go for an early septic shock like low uh, BP as well. So when you suspect a systemic infection like uh, or an early septic shock or something like that, how to diagnose it? So you need to draw a blood culture as soon as possible. Blood culture can be should be drawn from two sides. One is from the catheter side and the other from the peripheral side. At least 10 ml of blood should be sent for uh, culture from two different sides. And depending on the organism which is grown, the antibiotics can be started. So before that, in case if the patient is in shock, we need to start the patient on empirical antibiotics as well. So how do you choose empirical antibiotic cover? So you need to know what is the common organism which causes this infection. The most common organism which causes the infection are the gram-positive organisms. And the most common one are the staph aureus. So when you have the staph aureus, we classify it as two categories. One is MSSA and MRSA. When I say MSSA, it is methicillin sensitive staph aureus, uh, which is not that sick. And the second category is methicillin resistant staph aureus. For methicillin sensitive, you can usually give a common antibiotic like a cefazolin, where the patient usually responds to it. 
when you come to a methicillin resistant staph aureus infection whether you have to give the patient on higher antibiotics like a vancomycin or a ticoplanin or even daptomycin as well the second common organism which we encounter in the blood stream this is called as a crbsi that is means catheter related blood stream infection which usually happens if any patient develops fever within 48 hours after the catheter insertion we classify them as a crbsi and we have to exclude other causes of fever as well the second most common organism is an enterococci enterococci also we classify into two categories whether it's ampicillin sensitive or ampicillin resistant if it's ampicillin sensitive ampicillin can be given for the patient if it's resistant again vancomycin or linozolid uh, or daptomycin can be used the third most common organism are the gram negative organism which constitutes about 10% of the infection so uh, staph constitutes around 60% enterococcus around 20 to 30% the gram negative organism constitutes around 10% so this also we classify into two categories whether they are es esbl positive or esbl negative okay esbl negative are less serious infection where they are, where they usually respond to the common beta lactam antibiotics if they are esbl positive you have to put them on a higher antibiotics like the carbapenems or a beta lactam beta lactamase inhibitors like that so this is how we manage the the bleeding infections and the infection associated with it and the, the major thing is is to prevent this infection as i told you so how do you prevent it is the proper way or the aseptic precautions you take it nowadays we have something called as antibiotic impregnated catheters also okay so which where the incidence of infections are also very less right so thank you so much for explaining it so clearly uh, uh dr shri chandran i would like to go over to you next and ask uh, uh, why is ultrasound guided vascular access an important tool Uh, for coronary catheterization basically ultrasound reduces the vascular and bleeding complications as explained by the previous speaker i would just go, I like to go into the depth of it there is actually more than 80% reduction in the catheter placement failure with the help of ultrasound guidance not only that there is greater than 50% reduction in mechanical complications such as arterial punctures local hematomas pneumothorax hemothorax all of them are actually reduced by more than 50% when you puncture with the help of ultrasound not only that you save a lot of money when you do it blindly with anatomic landmarks you'll be using more more needles more contrast not only that you'll be uh, the time for the procedure is also huge so to minimize all of these ill effects ultrasound guidance is the way forward now future ultrasound guided puncture would be a must for every person that would be the dictum see at the end of the day already patients are sick in the icu with other medical illness we don't want to have them with you know hydrogenic complications such as hemothorax or pneumothorax or you know arterial hematomas so you want to minimize all the complications you want to make the best outcome for each and every patient so ultrasound has several advantages i'd like to go into a little later but as in the previous past any femoral access was basically done with the help of anatomical landmarks basic palpation of the artery basic fluoroscopy identification of the femoral head and then puncturing with a regular needle but those days have gone now nowadays as dr madan had previously told we do a fluoroscopy do a proper ultrasound guided micro puncture puncture with a micro needle so bleeding complications are quite less and with the help of fluoroscopy we pass the wire and over that we pass the catheter so the chances of miss puncture is quite less so once you do ultrasound guided puncture not only we will you target your artery precisely but you'll also minimize complications so that's the major advantage of ultrasound guided puncture now there are several more advantages of ultrasound guided puncture one once you get your artery in time and you miss your surrounding structures chances of hematoma pseudo aneurysms are quite less so basically ultrasound guided puncture especially as the previous speaker had told with the micro puncture that is the way forward that's the future i think no, can i setup, add one I more thing to that what uh, sri chandran was telling uh, please go ahead dr swamikan uh, exactly the very rightly he was telling in an emergency imagine somebody is arrested you want to do a temporary pacemaker implantation time is ma time is very crucial factor so in that time if you are not able to get the access um it is going to be a tough and uh, it may result in a bad outcome so like he said now the ultrasound is going to be the future and uh, guiding through ultrasound it's going to get the puncture done in time and uh, it may save lives so i just want to add that uh, that 
particular uh, area where no you need to insert instantly and get the heart going so ultrasound is going to play a huge role in future only the thing you know in the ultrasound machine should be available now nowadays the small hand held the ultrasound machines are coming up so in future it may be the way to way forward to do the vascular access puncture right very interesting insight there from both of you dr shri chandra and dr swami kanu there uh, dr madan mohan going over to you next uh, how does the patient's cardiac status determine the choice of dialysis and the type of vascular access the uh, there are two types of uh, dialysis we normally take it forward uh, one is crrt and another is the capd see what is crrt is continuous renal replacement therapy see why we choose this instead of normal dialysis is because normal dialysis is they pull the uh, uh, fluid out with, within hours so which where the heart when the heart is in the failed state heart cannot take up the immediate uh, pulling of the a uh, fluid out so solution is that one day that is the meeting is that we are going to market and see it because uh, 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 yeah uh, so we will come back again so why we choose CRRT is when the in the failed heart the the suddenly removing the fluid is very dangerous. So we have to remove the fluid very slowly in the heart failed patient uh, so that the heart cannot get damaged like a hemodynamically. The vitals like a, a pulse and BP will be get uh, maintained throughout the procedure. We have to do slowly like a, instead of doing dialysis in three hours, uh, this will be done at the rate of twenty four hours. so the, normally generally for a heart failure patient the crrt is advised then second is uh, like a capd continuous uh, uh, ambulatory peritoneal dialysis so again there also it is uh, the fluids are removed out from the body in a very slow manner so the, these are all uh, things for the heart failure patients so normally we recommend the crrt where slowly the fluid is uh, uh, removed right Uh, Dr. Swami, can I coming over to you next? Um, my question is: What are some of the major hemodynamic changes that lead to cardiac consequences during hemodialysis? You know, the, we have been doing it for uh, the hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. So, hemodialysis uh, is, you know, the you are removing the certain amount of blood continuously and purifying it and getting it back to the blood circulation. so the fluctuations of blood pressure during dialysis is known to occur very commonly the blood pressure depends on two important factors one is the cardiac output the other one is the peripheral vascular resistance so the the during dialysis the cardiac output tends to come down so that the blood pressure falls drastically during the uh, dialysis this is one of the Uh, complications or the adverse reactions that come during dialysis so the reduction in the cardiac output fall in the blood pressure it will adversely affect the perfusion of other organs in the body so the cardiac events that you are going to end up in a low cardiac output status because of which the most of the organs will not be getting their share of blood supply so one of the commonest complications that occurs during uh, the dialysis is hemodynamic uh, disturbances which is the fall in blood pressure what we call is uh, hypotension during the other thing that can occur uh, okay is infection through the dialysis uh, process you may if it is not done in a aseptic manner it may end up in infection the other hemodynamic disturbances that can occur is the bleeding bleeding also is that can occur uh, if it is not uh, done properly the puncture is not done properly can lead to 
but by and large the commonest uh, complication is the hypotension because of the reduction in the cardiac output right thank you for that dr swami karna dr shivraj um, how can a health professional identify ongoing and delayed complications with vascular access devices so as i was uh, talking before also and explaining so what the complications we usually encounter we classify into two categories one is immediate complication other one is a delayed complication okay when you say an immediate complication the first one is a bleeding which can usually uh, result in hematoma which can be diagnosed actually by an examination itself or by an ultrasound you'll be able to diagnose that the second complication as you mentioned is an arrhythmia which usually happens which can be which you can see because all the patients are connected to the monitors uh, multi para monitors so you'll be able to detect the arrhythmia so the simple ecg you'll be able to detect an arrhythmia as well the third complication which i told you is a pneumothorax which i was mentioning or a hemothorax as well uh, a, a proper ultrasound chest or a chest x ray uh, in case any doubts you can even do a ct of the chest to identify this complication and the other fourth important complication is an air embolism which can usually develop okay this air embolism which develops during the removal of the catheter as well so the proper precaution as well the patient should be kept in the tendril and nerve position and the second thing what you have to do is like while removing the catheter make sure the patient is doing is an expiration phase that's the valsalva maneuver so that the intrathoracic pressure is more than the atmospheric pressure and there's no chance of any um air embolism as well so these are the usual immediate complications we usually encounter the delayed complications we usually in long term cath uh, venous catheters when we have all those things the first thing which i was telling you uh, during my last uh, like uh, when we spoke is about the infection so where we do a blood culture to identify it the second is the vascular uh, devices or the catheters getting blocked which we call it as stenosis and as dr sreechandran was mentioning about the vascular thrombosis also so how do we detect these things we detect by using usually doing a doppler ultrasound where of the upper extremities or the uh, the vessels where you will be able to identify the thrombus as well the third compli uh, the other complications are as dr madan was telling about cardiac tamponade as well which can be easily identified by doing an echocardiogram and sometimes you can in long standing devices it can even cause some myocardial ruptures as well no injuries so these are the common uh delayed complications right thank you for that dr shivraj dr shri chandran um do vad's uh, related complications increase economic burden on patients and healthcare system and how can it be prevented yeah this question is uh, actually been answered by the previous speaker definitely it uh, increases the economic burden of the patients and uh, how to prevent such Uh, complications are quite simple uh, do a proper puncture by a specialist team member so that would be the uh, first step second is early identification of complications all the complications which was addressed by the previous speaker dr shivraj has to be identified in an early manner in the early diagnosis you know uh, saves a lot of complications so making a quick diagnosis and rectifying it in an early way will definitely help in you know uh, preventing further issues associated with the complications now there are several complications which has to be uh, you know discussed in detail such as a simple infection if not you know identified in an early way such as patients who present with fever having a hypotension tachycardia basic mechanism such as hand hygiene proper site preparation all of this will lead to you know less chance of infection when you come to a condition known as air embolism which was just spoken by dr sivraj how do you identify air embolism first look for signs of sudden onset of dyspnea which is new in onset look for any vague chest pain look for any new onset cough again look for signs of uh, tachycardia there is high heart rate look for low blood pressure all of this will give an a suspicion of air embolism so how do you prevent this make sure your syringes which contain fluid and prevent injection of air into the system use a closed system which has connectors such as a lock mechanism where even if air is injected you know it's prevented by the lock subsequently how do you manage air embolism give oxygen change the patient to the left side with the head actually lower than the heart level and prevent obviously the most important is to prevent further air leak so this is as far as air embolism is concerned now coming to cath catheter occlusion now the catheter can be occluded by several mechanisms the most common one is thrombosis as we had, as we had already spoken earlier thrombosis is a very notorious complication and the only way to prevent is again early identification if you suspect thrombosis of the catheter start anticoagulation as early as possible and give for at least 3 months 
Suppose you have to have an indwelling catheter for longer duration, please continue anticoagulation coagulation as long as the catheter is inside the lumen. Now, other uh, common side effects as far as uh, catheter is concerned is a catheter malposition. Suppose you feel your catheter is actually moved out of its position. In how to identify this? Just check for backflow. If there is no backflow, obviously your catheter is out of position. Then the only way in helping the patient is removal of the catheter and reintroducing another new catheter. So these are how the ways, you know, where you can help in quick identification of all these complications so that the economic burden of the patient is not skyrocketing. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that, Dr. Sri Chandran. But Dr. Madan Mohan, what are the potential complications that, in, that can occur during the procedural placement of central venous catheter insertion? As we uh, discussed earlier, uh, this is a central. This is the area where we put the central venous catheter. So, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, like uh, one is like uh, going and hitting the heart uh, where the tamponade, then perforation. So, all those things uh, and uh, air embolism, like uh, everything is when we put the central venous catheter, we have to uh, precisely monitor and uh, look for it, and. Uh, Another uh, complication, of, uh, apart from this central venous, uh, I like to tell about the new emerging uh, uh, technology in this new era, uh, where the valve replacement, uh, uh, like uh, without opening the uh, chest, uh, we implant the uh, aortic and mitral valve through the uh, artery and vein from the femoral area, that is in the thigh, so which is more... Uh, crucial nowadays because the catheter size is very big for this TAVI. Uh, TAVI is not, nothing but the aortic valve implantation through the artery. So uh, earlier, the catheter, what we use for the angios are very smaller ones. It's a five French uh, catheter. But the catheter, what we use for the TAVI is uh, very high. It's like uh, it is 20 French catheter. So it is very huge compared to the, the catheter what we use for the coronary, that is for the angio. So we, we have to be very careful when we introduce those catheter inside the vessel. So for this, all the points what we have been talking about, uh, one is fluoroscopy, ultrasound guided. So these are all uh, very essential to avoid all the complications like uh, puncturing neighboring vessel or uh, blood uh, clotting like uh, uh, hematoma near the site area and uh, uh, aneurysm or fistula formation. So these are all very uh, uh, crucial things we have to uh, see while puncturing the artery because it's a big, high French, 20 French catheter. So there's a new emerging uh, technology, the STAVI. When we do, we have to be very precise while doing it. So uh, for that, we take the fluoro and mark the area that the femoral head, that is a bone uh, landmark we take. And with ultrasound guide, we puncture the vessel, one is anterior posterior puncture. We have to puncture in the anterior, that is above. And then we see the bifurcation of two blood vessels joining. Above that, we have to puncture. So that uh, these are all the markers for puncturing the uh, vessel. If you puncture exactly above the bifurcation, that is two blood vessels joining and anterior puncture, so no complication will arise. So, which is, which is very essential for when we do the TAVI. So, these are all the uh, points which we have to think before doing, so to avoid all the complications, uh, as we said earlier, like a perforation or hematoma formation, uh, all those things. Uh, thank you, Dr. Madan Mohan. Dr. Swami Karna, would you have anything to add to the same question about the complications arising due to the... Uh... The one of the things uh, which uh, we missed uh, somewhere along the line is... Uh... Um, the losing the devices during procedure. Yeah, correct. The, yeah, that's an important sometimes thing. Sometimes we lose the stent. Sometimes we lose the get the, the guide wires. This has uh, happened uh, with me one or two times. So I just wanted to add that you have to be careful in holding the guide wires and uh, your stents in place. So nothing yeah. more to add. Actually, it was a good discussion. Yeah, it's a, called a closure device. Uh, so, uh, see, we, we, are, we all talked about the puncture, uh, how to prevent the complication. There is a system called closure device. So, we have to use the per close. It's called per glide, where we use that uh, per glide 
uh, insert like a suturing. So normally those days uh, there's a compression, so blindly compressed uh, after the puncture area while coming out. But now for the closing, we have the per-close device uh, with the suture material and other things. The patient can even walk within two hours, three hours uh, because it uh, nicely it uh, gets uh, the glued. The, uh, the glue is kept in that area. It gets sealed nicely. So we use this per perglide for closing the uh, puncture site area in the vessel. So this is the latest uh, thing uh, emerging and we started uh, using those things now. Right. It is better we have a protocol for each uh, procedures and uh, so that we prevent uh, the complications and prevent the patients paying more, the, especially the economic burden. Not only the economic burden, the hospital say the man days loss is also will be more if they tend to stay because of the infection, because of the complications of the vascular access procedures. So the key is uh, training and training and training. To get trained yourself. Right. Uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Shivraj, uh, I wanted to ask you, in addition to the contemporary techniques, what are the modern techniques available to optimize various vascular access uh, procedures which improves the patient safety through lesser manual interactions, thereby minimizing the risk. See, as we were, as everyone had discussed, see the um, first of the going to the history of the vascular axis. Actually, um, the first vascular axis device or the catheter insertion was done in 1957 by Mr. Seldinger. That's why it's called Seldinger's technique. So over the period of time, it has kind of completely evolved. 20 years back and all. Uh, people used to do that procedure very blindly in the sense like uh, people view the anatom uh, anatomical side, they kind of visualize, they palpate and uh, they feel the carotids and then they push it and kind of do the venous axis. Now, um, going against the contemporary way as it was discussed, now we use something called real-time ultrasound axis. Okay? So when you use ultrasound, there are two things. One is static and other one is dynamic. Okay. When, you, when I say static means where you just put an ultrasound probe and you just mark it and afterwards you kind of do the procedure. When I say it's dynamic, you, you still visualize the guide wire going in, the needle going in. So the operator who's kind of doing it should hold it on one side and insert the needle. Sometimes some people prefer someone else to hold the, the probe, the ultrasound probe. Okay, So it's better the same person does it where it will be much more easier. That is number one. The number two, the type of probe which we use for ultrasound is also very, very important because uh, sometimes we might be doing in some very tight locations where we need a, a, a thinner probe, like a hockey stick kind of probe. And the, the normal probes are usually flat. And if it's an obese uh, person, you need a much more like a curved probe, something like that. So the type of probes you use is also very, very important. So ultrasound guided access, like a real-time ultrasound, is really, really very important as we had discussed earlier. And uh, so, so doing a procedure through a real-time ultrasound, it saves time, it saves the burden as well, and uh, it's safe for the it's really safe for the patient. And uh, in real time nowadays, we have something called intravascular ultrasound also, okay, where um, we'll be able to see the vessels inside, um, going putting a probe inside the vessel, you'll be able to see the atherosclerosis, the plaques, and stuff like that. So we have something called an angioscope and intravascular ultrasound, etc. Probably the cardiologist can be will should be able to add a thing about intravascular ultrasound for the coronary procedures. Uh, right. Uh, thank you so much for that, doctor. Uh, I think in continuation with this uh, topic, Dr. Sri Chandran, I would like to ask you: What are the contemporary techniques used to achieve optimal arterial access uh, in cardiac catheterization? Yeah, it was just spoken by the earlier speaker. Yes. Now, nowadays, uh, actually before coming to the latest procedures, mm -hmm. in the foregone era, it was basically done on inspection, palpation, and then doing a blind puncture. But those days are gone now. As we had just discussed now, first we we'll usually do fluoroscopy, identify the femoral head. We're talking about the femoral artery per se first. So identify the femoral head, make sure you puncture with a micropuncture needle, just above the uh, bifurcation of the two femorals and that too with the help of uh, ultrasound guidance. So I'll repeat again, uh, fluoroscopy, identify the femoral head, ultrasound guidance, use a micropuncture needle and then 
visualize the needle specifically going into the artery pass a guide wire a floppy guide wire and through that we pass a sheath probably a 5 french or a 6 french sheath then start the angiogram as per any normal procedure so this is the most recent contemporary way of accessing a femoral artery for femoral angiograms as dr madan was saying with newer tech, newer uh, novel uh, therapeutic procedures like tavi or any ibp or ecmo those kind of procedure require a large bore access needle so with help of ultrasound we definitely we would minimize the the incidence of uh, uh, you know contralateral artery puncture or surrounding uh, hematomas pneumothor sorry uh, uh, bleeding into the abdomen all of this can be prevented by ultrasound guided puncture so this would be the most advanced technique of making punctures in the femoral as far as the wrist is concerned there is a radial artery again we do can puncture the radial artery with the help of ultrasound guidance because we don't want to avoid any radial nerve injury or contralateral ulnar injury all that can be prevented by help of ultrasound guided puncture right thank you so much dr shri chandran for that uh, dr madan mohan um i i wanted to know for better patient safety what are the critical improvements that need to be implemented in order to minimize the errors and complications during vascular access yeah it's like a clubbing the whole agenda today i think as uh, all doctors uh, commented say one is like ultrasound guider another is a fluoroscopy so these are all the gadgets uh, we use with uh, uh, special uh, needles like a micropuncture to prevent all these uh, complications and one more thing i like to add here most uh, like uh, the small baby is like uh, asd vsd like a hole in the heart so normally we forget uh, the like a uh, called the air entering the hole from one chamber to the another chamber which will go to the brain and cause a uh, brain issues so to prevent that what we generally recommend is uh, there is a venflon so we normally put venflon for uh, starting the drip so there is a special venflon called filter venflon so there there is a filter inside the venflon so the air won't go inside the uh, vein so then it won't cross the one chamber to the another chamber from venous to the like uh, one, the what the, the drip we put here then straight away the air goes to the heart through the venous side and goes to the brain so it crosses from one chamber to another chamber through the hole so to prevent that we use this uh, filter venflon so we have to keep in our mind whenever we give all this uh, fitness uh, here yeah. for this asd vsd surgeries uh, uh, for other surgeries these kind of patients we you should use uh, filter vent for right uh, i would like to pose one more final question to dr swami kanda and shivraj and wrap up the session uh, uh, so dr uh, swami kanda coming to you next uh, how can a patient be educated on vascular access safety and what sort of informed choices should they make to avoid compromising their safety very 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 important to get the consent of the patient before you do anything the entire procedure uh, is to be explained to them in a in a language that they understand and also get the consent that they are willing telling them all the complications that can come around the vascular access procedures especially when you are doing a, a cardiac catheterization uh the it may be a simple venous peripheral venous catheterization so you have to tell the patient there are patients who by look of it they'll faint so you have to tell them that when you puncture there will be blood so i've seen incidences where you know, the, the moment they see the blood they faint so make them understand it is a, what is a procedure that you are doing what are the complications uh, that can come around and uh, get the confidence of the patient and make make them understand that will be the key to do any procedure and for the good outcome right thank you so much for that dr swami kanna dr shivraj uh, my final question to you would be what do you think is going to be the future of vascular access technology uh, we did discuss a few of those aspects but any emerging studies or research aspects that you are particularly excited about see i like to talk about avi fis plus here okay because we haven't spoken about it avi fis plus see um see what uh, 
what is an av fistula why is it created actually it is used usually for a dialysis patient okay so this dialysis patient on a, or on a catheter these venous catheters and probably the you can't keep it for some time so you have to create the fistula which is done by a vascular surgeon okay so what happens so sometimes these catheters so what is a fistula it's just a a graft which connects the artery and the vein okay sometimes those gets blocked as well so common uh, the graft which is used is a prosthetic uh, graft which is pentatetrafluoroethylene graft so what happens when all the vessels are thrombosed or blocked okay you need to create a very um uh, like another graft so another imaging thing which is happening is something called a hero graft which is something but the hemodialysis reliable outflow graft basic so what happens is this we use this prosthetic graft which connects the the brachial artery and as well and it is there connected to another lumen that lumen uh, that's a single outflow lumen which is connected to the the major vessels and it goes to the uh, right atrium so this is one of the modern techniques which is being followed in people uh, like where all the vessels are thrombosed and uh, and the uh, av fistulas are unable to be created in the upper extremities then we have other grafts as well such as the allo graft the zeno graft and also tissue engineered graft which has been emerging in us but it's not in approved right now which kind of mimics the human body cells so um, and uh, these grafts have got a lesser chance of uh, infection the, so when you say the allograph this are the nothing but cryo preserved uh, the vessels like the femoral vessels which are cryo preserved and uh, the xenograft are nothing but the bovine and the coronary vessels and the mesentery vessels which are usually prepared which has cause less chance of infection these are some uh, some emerging things which are happening in the vascular axis right now right thank you so much for that dr shivraj with that we come to the end of this uh, very very interesting and insightful session so thank you so much for joining us today dr madan mohan uh, dr swami karna dr shivraj and dr sri chandran uh, it was a very informative session i'm sure there are like a lot of takeaways uh, thank you for joining us uh, joining the times of india as well as biological e on this webinar on optimizing vascular access and patient safety We hope to have many such informative sessions with you in the future. Thank you so much. Sure.